What the heck is Paul talking about in our First Corinthians reading today? That might have been your reaction as you were hearing it read. And often, let's be honest, there are readings in our services where after we get done reading them, we're puzzled as to what they mean and maybe a little afraid. I think the reading from 1 Corinthians today is one of those readings that we're not really sure what to make of it and we're afraid to find out. Let me repeat perhaps the part that is the most bizarre to listen to. This is verses 29 through 31. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. What does that mean? How are we supposed to make sense of Paul's difficult words? Well, in the following two verses, Paul, using marriage as an example, discusses one of the main difficulties of the Christian life, one that I think we all share. One prompted by the question, how am I supposed to live my life as a disciple of Jesus? How am I supposed to order my life as a disciple? Do you feel that your allegiance, your attention and devotion are pulled in lots of different ways? That when you wake up in the morning, you're overwhelmed by the number of things that you think you have to get done like you're trying to keep a bunch of spinning plates up in the air and you feel like you can't let a single one drop. I think if we're being honest with one another, we all feel that at times, some stronger than others. But I think Paul is addressing this tension in the Christian life with his words here as he writes to the new Christians at the church he started in Corinth. He's providing an answer to the question, how do I live my life in Christ? You see, the context of the letter of Paul's writing is that he's giving instructions to new Christians who are struggling with this question, people who their whole lives they'd grown up, didn't know about Jesus, didn't know about the triune God and the message of the gospel, and all of a sudden the gospel has come in and transformed them and their life, and they don't know what to do. Do we just leave behind everything we were doing before? That is sort of the nature of the gospel. It's so all-encompassing, so earth-shattering and life-changing that it brings about these questions. And it's really plagued disciples of Jesus from even before this letter to the Corinthians. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching Christ crucified to a gathering of people in Jerusalem. And as soon as he is done, the text says that they are cut to the heart. And they look at the apostles and they ask them, what shall we do? Now that Jesus has been made known to them, that He's the Son of God, the Messiah, and that He died and rose from the dead, and now everything has changed, that seems like a good question to ask. What should we do? How should we live? And I know that uh, you're wrestling with these questions. After all, we're beginning next week a Bible study based on feedback from you about questions about how do I navigate life today as a disciple of Jesus? How am I supposed to speak? How am I supposed to live? How am I supposed to love and be faithful to God? Martin Luther certainly wrestled with this question in his day during the Reformation. At his, in his day, the church taught that a holy life, probably based off of verses like this one in 1 Corinthians, is living your life 100% devoted to God, and they interpret that as separating yourself from the world and dedicating your life to service in the church. 
That's the idea the monastic orders, monks and nuns, was based on. That by being in the world, your attentions, your devotion is divided. That you become focused on not the things of God, but the things of this world. Luther, who passionately pursued that idea as a monk himself, ended up rejecting it and finding that the Scriptures teach us something else entirely. And from what he found in God's Word, he, he created a doctrine or he penned a doctrine that we call today vocation. Now, the doctrine of vocation teaches us that because of the salvific work of Jesus Christ, the earthly tasks of His disciples have been transformed. They're no longer futile work in a world that is perishing, but rather holy work that bears witness to God and the world that is to come. Now, some examples of this holy work are being a husband and a wife, a son or a daughter, a lawyer, janitor, pastor, teacher, etc., as I shared with the children. That these things were just sort of the mundane things of life until Christ comes along, and now it is holy work that He is asking you to do in His name, in accordance with His will, and to His glory. And that He's asked us to live and love and speak in certain ways as we carry out these tasks. So we're not called to separate from the world. Luther would say that we're sent into it carrying out these various earthly offices in accordance with God's will so that we can be, as he would say, masks of God wherever he sends us. That God is using us to bring his glory to bear in the lives of those whom he sends his disciples to. In other words, through faith in Christ, living in the world has become part of our devotion to God part of our praise and honor and glory of Him, part of our worship of Him. After all, when we get to the second part of the text, verses 32, He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. That sounds nice. But our world today is so anxious. Why is that? Well, God is missing. And the form of this world that Paul says is passing away is coming back more than it was before, and with it the feeling of futility and emptiness in tasks that get their meaning from God. Then he says also in verse 35, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you. Now, if what Paul says here is what we think it means when we're afraid to find out the answer to this text, which is something similar to this idea that you should separate yourself from the world in order to only focus on God and be undivided in your devotion to Him. These statements from Paul don't make sense. I want you to be free from anxieties, and I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you. Well, it certainly sounds like a restraint. If I'm to live a holy life, I need to separate myself from the people in my life. I mean, imagine the Christians in Corinth, people who are married and working jobs, and all of a sudden Paul blows into town, tells them about this God-man Jesus who loves them so much that he died on the cross and rose from the dead, and his victory is their victory. Now what? Am I to leave my unbelieving spouse behind? Should I quit my job so I can follow Paul around to all these other cities? It's clear from these statements that Paul makes about anxiety and not wanting to place a restraint upon you that he's not advocating for this sort of devotion. Now, it may be that someone sitting here in these pews is called to be a pastor in the future or a missionary, and then your calling may look a little bit more like Paul's or the disciples in our gospel reading today. But God works through many vocations in many different ways. But as much as the doctrine of vocation helps us out here, Paul's warning is still pertinent. He's talking about a reality that all of us, I think, are intimately familiar with, the feeling I mentioned earlier about your devotion and attention and your time 
and your emotions being pulled in all kinds of different ways under the different obligations that your vocations have placed upon you. Paul's talking about that tension of being a Christian who is in the world but not of the world, who works the jobs that other people work and lives in the families like other people live, but yet different. Because now through Christ, your life and work and calling have been transformed into a holy task which glorifies Him and bears witness to Him in the world. But Paul summarizes his thoughts in verse 35, and I'll read the whole thing this time. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. You see, the doctrine of vocation teaches us that Paul isn't saying abandon your earthly callings. Don't divorce your wife so that you can be 100% devoted to God. Don't quit your job. Don't stop doing the daily tasks needed to provide for your children or your spouse or your neighbor. Instead, knowing as he reveals to us here that the form of this present world is passing away, live your earthly offices firmly keeping the kingdom of heaven in mind. Your life now takes on a new form. It no longer resembles the form of the world that's passing away, a form that is empty and despairing and futile, a form that gets up in the morning and wonders, why am I going through all of these motions? How is it that I'm not treading water and getting nowhere? Instead, now because of Christ, your life takes on a new form, the form of the resurrected Christ, who is the first fruits of this new world, this new creation, a world where God loves and has redeemed sinners and made them His own, a world where God's love in Christ has transformed all of the tasks that you have been given in your vocations into holy work that glorifies His name and bears witness to this truth. It's the form of the risen Christ in you. So I conclude my sermon this morning with an invitation to reflect on the vocations that God has called you into. You've been made new and holy in Christ. You have been bought with the precious blood of the Lamb, redeemed from all of your sins, and given a new, unstoppable, eternal life that death cannot even defeat anymore. How then should you live? How then should your life be in good order, to use the words of Paul? And this reflection is important for all Christians for two reasons. One, as Paul points out at the start of our text, the present form of this world is passing away. The resurrection and ascension of Christ marks a turning point in all of creation, after which our lives are now oriented towards the new kingdom that He is making manifest in His Son. And two, if our earthly offices become disconnected from our new life in Christ, if they become instead occasions for us to ignore God, beware, because then they divide our devotion among multiple masters. And the Bible tells us that despite how hard we would try, we cannot serve two masters. They end up shaping us back into the form of this world that's passing away rather than into the form of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. So I ask you, have your earthly obligations become disconnected from God? Are they taking your devotion away from Him? Because our vocations aren't meant to restrain us and keep us from God. In Christ, they've been transformed. Now they are a means by which God shapes us and all those He sends us to in the world into the form of His Son. Now they are a means by which He makes us witnesses to His glory. So I encourage you to reflect on this. I am a new creation in Christ. What does that mean for my life? How does that change how I'm a husband, a wife, a son or daughter, a wife, a worker, a neighbor, fill in the blank? And I'll close echoing the words of Paul once more. 
I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the salvation you have in Christ Jesus until He comes again to make all things new. Amen.